So Joe Confino, share with us a little bit about where we are. We're sitting in front of this beautiful bell tower and then we can yeah. learn a little bit more about you. Great. So uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so we're sitting in the southwest of France in the Plum Village Monastery of Zen Master Thich Nhat Hanh. And as you say, we're sitting uh, in front of the great bell tower. And this great bell is invited every morning and every evening before meditation. And, uh, and also, uh, you can't see, but we are facing um, about 20 meters away the hut of Thich Nhat Hanh where he used to uh, live. It's called the Sitting Still Hut, and that has a view out over the French countryside. And behind us is a lotus pond, um, which fits very well with the theme of No Mad No Lotus. And then we have some children that are playing soccer and ping pong which um, is also part of Plum Village right now in the summer retreat that has lots of families and kids playing about. Yeah, and the, the lotus flowers are just starting to come up. And one of the things I love about here is um, the monks, what they do is they make tea within the lotus blossom. So they literally tie it together, pour water in, leave it there. And then when it opens, mm. then they have a fresh cup of lotus tea. So how about that? And when it rains, the children grab the leaves and use them for umbrellas, yes. which tells you a little bit about the size <laughs> of these leaves. They're massive. These yeah. aren't uh, water lilies. Yeah, these are massive flowers. Beautiful. So here we are. We set, set a good scene yeah. there. And I, you know, I asked you ahead of time to send in your bio. You sent to this very, very long bio that I'm going to read, which is you host the podcast called The Way Out Is In. That was yeah. your bio. <laughs> Oh, yes, that's it. And then you said, is there anything you want to talk about? And I said, anything. Anything. Well, because I love the spontaneity. Yeah. You know, the non-preparation means that we're, you know, we haven't spoken before and we're just present and what will emerge will emerge and what doesn't doesn't. And that is good enough. Yeah. I love that. I love it too. No notes, no questions. Yeah. Just present. Just being present. Exactly. But you did give me a little leading off point, which is The Way Out Is In, the title of your podcast, but the, the gata of Thich Nhat Hanh. And these days, it's also the entryway to my home. So when you open the door to my home, there is a sign. It's such a great thing to have at, at the entrance of your home that says The Way Out Is In. Oh, and uh, tell us a little bit about that, what it means to you personally, and then maybe link it to you being here. Hmm. How Joe Confino is in the south of France. Ended up in the middle yeah. of absolutely given, nowhere and the center of everywhere. Yeah, given your life quote before. Yeah. yeah. So the reason I chose or thought that The Way Out Is In was a good name for the podcast is because it, for me it sums up what is helpful for us in life and often what we avoid. So normally for us, for many people, The Way Out Is Out. In other words, we seek uh, distractions and we seek avoidance and we seek to um, sort of move towards what we think will give us happiness um, and often ends up giving us nothing. Um, and for in my life what has always been more profound is to look in and when I when I actually really face into myself and face into life then the answers I get are more profound. I find a deeper sense of happiness and joy and, and also more meaning. And, and the distractions of life, you very quickly see that that's all they are. They're just ways of avoiding understanding who we are, ways of avoiding um, looking into the depths of our souls. And, um, and yet each time I've looked inwards, what I realize is this huge space. And I, I, I once saw this video um, where you see two people, I think on a deck chair, and then it goes outwards 10 times for each image. And very soon you're in space looking down and these people almost disappear into speck and you see the earth and you just see this extraordinary spaciousness of, of, the, you know, of the cosmos. And then they go the other way and then they go inwards 10 by 10 by 10 by 10. And what you see when you go into the body, in, into matter, is there's only space. And so, um, so I like the idea that when we look in, it's like um, astronauts going into space and exploring frontiers that have not been explored before. And, and yet each of us can do that in our own life. And we can do it with each other. Yes. As a therapist, as a psychologist, 
that's a lot of my work, is, is helping people find their way out by going in, but also us being present and going in with each other, yes. right? To, to hear the, the, like when you find a little, it's like a masseuse that finds a knot, that's where you linger a little more. Yes. In our painful spots. Yeah. And, it, and you know, one of the deep practices here is, is just, it's called deep listening. Mm -hmm. And I was speaking to one of my brothers yesterday and, and we were just talking about people very rarely get listened to these days and, and very rarely have the time or given the time to express themselves and just be present with somebody else and just be deeply heard and to be in a safe space where they can open up and be vulnerable. And so, you know, for me, exactly what you're saying is that when we deeply listen to each other with a tenderness and a care and a, and a real openness and a wish to be present, then how amazing is that? You know, who doesn't benefit from that? Yeah, most people, or a lot of people, are feeling very lonely and not connected and and that's when actually the pain actually comes up the strongest is when we don't have any connections and when we have connections and friends and people who care about us then we can open up much more easily mm -hmm. so tell us a little bit about you how you ended up here in the <laughs> south of france at the great bell tower well i i would say it's due to having a good woman oh. because <laughs> because it was due my wife uh introduced me to take that town when we first came back together 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago. Um, and the reason we came to live here is that before this, I was, uh, we were living in New York. I was working for the Half Post running a number of sections and obviously New York's very busy and the work's very busy and there's lots of pressures on media, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and what we realized is that we were sort of looking to live a different sort of life. And we had been coming to Plum Village every year at the same time, so uh, which is the winter. So we got the first time we came here, we were married by um, by Sister Chen Kong, who is the sort of in a sense the closest um, peer to Thich Nhat Hanh. And then we would come every year for two weeks to celebrate our wedding and and to be part of this community. And so when we were looking at what was the next stage of our life, it just felt very natural to say, actually, let's have a complete change. Let's go from being at 100 miles an hour to being at zero miles an hour, you know, just, just, to, just to stop, just to be present and just to more deeply engage with this community and the practices. So does it really go to zero miles an hour? Because my experience <laughs> of it is 100 miles an hour, it's like a fan going really, really fast. <laughs> And then you turn off the fan and it's still going. Yeah. And it takes me a while to, to settle here. But even when I settle here, those tendencies, the busyness can find its way in. I mean, here we are, I'm doing a podcast interview. <laughs> I'm technically working. I mean, I've been here for a while. We had a full yeah. retreat, but the, I do find that there's a way, and, and, and I am curious about this with you because I've, I've seen you are quite productive and busy and active in the world. You just got back from a trip, which I'm curious about. Mm. Uh, you are doing a lot, and maybe you're doing it in a different way. And, and you know, the, the title of this podcast is Wise Effort, like that there's an effort, but it's a different type of effort that mm. maybe you engage in or can engage in when you're in a more centered space. Or Yeah, so I'll tell you that when I, when I, came to when we came to live here I made a commitment to myself because what I realized is that in all the doing in the world so so you know I'd spent 30 years on as I had been a journalist for 40 years but 30 years of that was focused on sustainability and climate and you know trying to do things at scale trying to reach as many people as possible in order to change people's minds and educate them and and help save the world mm -hmm. and all that good stuff and um what I realized is that I'd lost my connection to intimacy. So I was doing stuff at scale, but I wasn't deeply connected to that because of my busyness and I was looking out always. And so I made a commitment that what I wanted to do was come back to intimacy. So from, go from scale to intimacy and, and come back and do things or be present for things where I felt a deep connection, where I was fully engaged in it, where, where there was not a separation between me and the work, where there was a natural flow that my effort flowed into the work, my work flowed into 
who I am. And, and it, there was a sort of um, almost a, a regenerative or generative exchange. Whereas in the past, it was very linear that I'd put a lot of effort in to try and make a difference, but there was often very little coming back. Right. So, so, and a very short way of saying that is I, I wanted to create a sense of spaciousness. Because what I realize is when I work with, because my main work, my, the way I earn an income here is through coaching. And that most people I'm coaching with are very, very busy. And I didn't want to, oh, we've got a... Uh, you know who that is? A, no. That is a, the teenage boys, including one of mine. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right <laughs> that's my mom he said <laughs> that's my mom hello mom okay go ahead um when you came into coaching yeah was that if i was taking on lots of clients and i was as busy coaching as the people i was coaching then what i was offering people was my busyness right and i what i wanted to offer people was a sense of spaciousness that each person i spoke to um I was able to be there 100 percent because there was nothing before, nothing after. And and I have to say at this point, that's easy for me because I'm 62 years old. You know, I'm my I don't have great financial security, but I have enough financial security not to worry. And so younger people who maybe are building their life, you know, aren't in the same, let's say, the same position and also are in a different stage of life where they're building something. Right. And I'm you know, you talk about wise effort. That's the name of the podcast for me wise effort is no effort in the sense that what i want to do and i was talking again to one of my my elder brother and he was saying you know i'm 70 years old and i want to share the wisdom i've accumulated in my life and that doesn't need to be hard work that can be just a sense of presence and um and being in plum village if i say what is one of the key reasons i came here was what Thich Nhat Hanh offered was presence, was deep sense of presence. He was, he, he, when people came here, they felt who he was and he didn't have to say very much to be felt. And, and I think that's, you know, what inspired me was the sense that actually, how can I be more present? And I'll never be as present as him, but I can increasingly become more present, more aware, more able to uh, be in service to people. And that's what scales it. We think that being busy is what's gonna scale it, but actually sometimes it's just one interaction with one person where you're very present. That I've had experiences either with people being very present with me, especially when you're in a place of suffering. I remember once having a really hard, hard time and a yoga teacher coming over and just, and I was crying in Shavasana and she just grabbed my feet this was like a decade ago, and mm. I still remember the feeling of her touching yeah. my feet, right? That that can carry forward and spread to many people. We think that it's not doing much, but that, I mean, that's very much the practice of um, deep listening as well, being present. Yeah, and it can sometimes be the smallest thing. You know, I, I sometimes tell this story of my, um, my mother and father, who um, they're, they're the next door neighbors when I was growing up, when I'd actually left home, there was a daughter of the people who lived next door and she was, um, the parents were very busy all the time and she didn't get a chance to go out much. And, and they used to, my mum particularly, used to take her into London, the centre of London, to museums. And the museum she particularly, my mum liked and she took her to a few times was the Victoria and Albert Museum, which in London is a sort of, shows 5,000 years of sort of history of arts and culture and that sort of thing. And, and, then about 20 years later, there was a knock on my mum's door. My dad had passed away by then. And there was this girl who is now a woman, and, you know, and she said, I just came to thank you because as a result of going to the Victoria album, I just fell in love with old objects. And now I'm, I, I'm sort of my business is sort of buying and selling antiques. Mm. And if you hadn't inspired me in that way, I wouldn't have done that. Mm. And so, um, so that was just a really great sense of effort can be very, very small. Right. Sometimes it's a really little thing, but the ripples go out, as you say. And, and most of the time we have no idea the impact of our life. But actually, if we fully show up, then we can trust that what needs to happen will happen. And you're also alluding to um, community and interbeing there, right? So 
one of the things that becomes really evident here at Plum Village when you're in this Sangha, in this, in this community. Well, one thing is that when you become more aware of noise, <laughs> As we have lots of As we're experiencing, past. as these teenage boys, 27 teenage <laughs> boys walk past. Well, here's one thing. When you become more aware of noise, you make less noise. And uh, when you're aware of other people impacting you and you impacting other people, you tread differently. But also you can see how one, it's just fascinating here, like how one community member can do something that's slightly different, that can take the whole sea, the whole flow, in a different direction, whether it's one community member that stops when the bell rings and maybe there's new people at the Plum Village and they don't know yet that that's what we do, we stop when the bell rings, but just get maybe two or three people stopped when the bell rings, we all stop. And uh, that can go in a positive direction or a not so beneficial direction. So I, I'm curious about that for you because you are doing big global things. Yes, you're being present with people, but you just came back. Was it a work trip that you just came back from? I well, actually, so I was just back from Kosovo, uh, work, helping my wife who was doing um, four large scale installations around climate change. So yeah. I, I was on this trip, I was the unpaid assistant. Right. But I've been supporting her in building her, pract her art practice. She's an was, artist. Yeah, which is yeah. about sort of engaging people around climate change. Um, in a way that sort of reaches beyond just the intellect and the facts and figures and helps people to be in touch with it. Mm -hmm. How do you work in a more global way around climate change now? Well, that was the point, you know, when, so when I came back to working, to saying actually I want to be intimate, what I realized is I started working with people who are working at scale. Yeah. And what I, what I find, so I work with a number of climate leaders, whether it's sort of uh, heads of NGOs, youth activists, um, people from across the, across the board. And what I find with them is that they're burning out, a lot of them. They're, they're sort of really over busy. They are sort of feel the weight of the world on their shoulders. They feel they're having to save the world single handed. And what I seek to do is bring, help them to be intimate you know, create spaces in which they can come back to themselves, in which they can feel balanced, in which they can feel that they are, can regenerate themselves in order to do the work they do. So, um, so I, I think the scale is not always that we have to do the scale ourselves, but there's something around what it is to be in service to. And one of the things I love about Plum Village is when they talk about leadership. They talk about leading from the front, leading from the centre, and leading from the back. And that at different times we can be in the different places. So sometimes we need to lead from the front. It's about saying, actually, let's, let's all move forward. Sometimes you need to lead in the middle, which is to hold two parts together. And sometimes you need to lead from the back, which is to make sure no one falls behind and to make sure that you're in service to everyone moving forward, but you don't have to be at the front. And I sort of really love that imagery because it, it talks about that we don't have to be always at the front. That, that is not always the necessary, it's not productive and it's not useful. And if everyone's trying to be at the front, and this is what I find a lot with what's wrong with our current system, is everyone stri is striving to be at the top of their game. Right. Everyone's to be leading and that leads to all the competition, it leads to the consumption, it leads to so many things because we're trying to stand out and with social media and everything, everyone wants to show perfection, stand out, show they're important. But if everyone's trying to be important in the same way, then what gets left out? And some of the magic happens at the back, <laughs> you know? <laughs> the folks that are at the back, my yeah. son goes to a school where they take these long bike trips and there's the nose and the tail, very much what you're talking about, the nose and the tail. So you may have 50 kids on a 50 mile ride, yeah. right? And inevitably this, Stretches stretch out, out, stretches out, stretches out. And there's some kids that are there three hours before the other kids. And there's always teachers. And my son, who's a, he's, he's a bike mechanic, so he has to do the whole, you know, the front yeah, yeah. and the back. He says that when he's at the back, that's sort of the best because he's with the people who are working the hardest. Mm -hmm. And that's where the perseverance actually is, is, is to know that your people are already there three hours ahead of you and you still have to keep going. And the, the courage it takes to keep going when you know people already made it. Talk about intimacy. And maybe you've experienced being at the back yourself with compassion for yourself, leading from the back. 
it's not a lot of glory, but maybe a little bit more reward. <laughs> yeah, well, well, to give you an example of that, in, I was, when I was just in Kosovo with my wife, there was quite a lot of digging. We needed a, someone to come and, and dig it out. And um, you, in Kosovo, there's a sort of central marketplace and uh, people were waiting for work and they don't get paid a lot, but uh, someone went and, and got one of these guys and he was digging. And, and you could tell that he was not treated very well normally. And we just sort of treated him with, with real respect. You know, we took him for coffee. We, you know, the work he was doing uh, was quite difficult. So I went and bought him gloves so that he didn't cut his hands. And, and then we asked him if he could come back the next day. And he had to travel an hour and a half by bus to get there. He got up at five o'clock, so he was there at seven rather than nine to help the next day. And, and you know, this was someone who, you know, in, in that, you know, we're using that metaphor at the back. He's at the back of society, at the back of, you know, of, of what it is to do, do work and, what it, you know, what people are recognised for. But his care and his attention, his commitment and his hard work and his wish to do the very best he could was just, just really shone for me. And he was being paid 40 euros for a day. And, um, and we formed just this great relationship. And I just thought, this is, this is what it's about. You know, if we, if we take away this discrimination of what is success, who is important, and just see people for who they are, then you start to create amazing change. And you start to see, actually, we're, we all want the same things in life. We all want to just be seen. We want to be respected. We want to feel that our life has meaning, that we have, that we're cared for. You know, it's, it's, so, it's so simple. Maybe there's an ease in the action, but you're still taking action, right? Yes. So when we are in a spot of feeling success or we're at the top of our game or we're at the front of the pack, the, the practice of letting some of that go or maybe even letting ourselves mm. move back. And that's very much what you described you did. I mean, you were in New York, you were very successful. You decided to move here. There is a, there's a process to that, which isn't always easy. Well, firstly, one of, the th so one of the things that I find very helpful here is the practice of the five remembrances. And they go like this, I am of the nature to get old, I will get old. I'm of the nature to get sick, I will get sick. I'm of the nature to die, I will die. It is natural that everything I love, everyone I love, I, need, I will at one day be separated from and that all I can count on is the impacts of my thoughts, speech, and action. And, and for me, that is the teaching of impermanence. Because what people fear when they're successful is, is they fear that they'll be, they won't be successful. But they fear that- That's true, what, they won't be at some point, right? Yes. And they, they're not gonna be at some point. So, <laughs> yeah. so, so I, I find time, how we, how we look at time very helpful because you know, it's, it's a bit like climate change. We, we tend to be very short-termist in our thinking. Mm -hmm. So we look at what's just in front of our nose. If we actually truly, as a human species, were able to see seven, seven generations forward, or in this culture to see seven generations forward, we would not do virtually anything that we're currently doing. But we think very short-term, and we do that in also in our own lives. We, we're so caught up in our thoughts and our, uh, our busyness that we find it very difficult to stop and reflect and to look with a different perspective, a different lens. And, but when we actually see things from a, a broader sense of time, we see that actually everything's changing all the time. And, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh used to say, you know, beware of being number one, because all you're going to do is fear being number two. And, you, and, and so, so this, this sense of what is actually, when we look at life, what is actually driving us? What do we really want? Are we just doing what we think we ought to be doing? Are we just following society's sort of, what they're teaching us is the right thing to do? Or are we actually deeply looking at our lives and saying, this is who I am, this is the person I am, this is the song I want to sing. And, and that takes courage to not be caught up in the maelstrom of life and not to fit in with everyone else. And, it, you know, it's a bit like, you know, the film The Matrix. Mm -hmm. You know, 
most people want to be in the matrix because it's comfortable and everyone else is and it's easy. And if you come out of the matrix, it's harder because you have to face into your suffering. You have to see that, you know, life is difficult. But when you start to recognize and start to work with that, it's like, it's like working the land. You've got this really rich loam that you're turning over and you're starting to see so much depth in it. Whereas when we're sort of just doing the opposite, it's like hard concrete, you know, we're not getting anywhere. Well, and beware of number one, because you may become number two, but I would add, beware of number one, because you, you create a number two. <laughs> you know, yeah, I think absolutely. that's part of the suffering is yes. that we, I mean, we're so focused on, I mean, obviously we're like, we don't want to, I don't want to suffer. And how, what suffering am I creating through, I mean, if you get really granular about it, through what I post or through what I write or through who I interview or through what I share or what I don't share because I don't want to look bad, right? That I've seen that have a direct effect on, on suffering because I've experienced it in the reverse, right? So it's, in some ways, it's, it's, it, that's also part of the reciprocal relationship of it when we step out of, when we see that we're all at the front, we're all at the middle, we're all at the back at different points in our life. We cycle through that then everyone gets to be at the front, the middle, and the back. And there's not, no one place that's better than the other. I, I agree with the seasons of life. Maybe I'm in a productive mm -hmm. season. And I also, um, I feel that winding down. Like I can feel the, the energy and, and the disenchantment yeah. with it. Like it just doesn't, it doesn't feel the same as when I was 30 and I was like, yeah, go, you know, let's go for it. All I want is to, yeah. yeah. Just coming back to one thing you said, you know, one of the things uh, I've done with Brother Fap, who is the abbot, is we've written a book called Being With Busyness, uh, which is coming out in, in October. And what, what I wrote, one of the things I wrote in there, because it's quite helpful, because it just helped me to think about this, is that, and it, it chimes very clearly with what you just said, is that if we're busy, then actually what we're doing is making all the people around us busy. Right. Because our busyness is not ours alone. And especially our business in the world is making other people have to do things and then those other people are busy and they're making us do things to meet their busyness so actually when you look at the world you know it's gone crazy because we're all busy to avoid our feelings and because we're all busy we're all making each other far busier because the busyness is coming from every angle and there's very little refuge for that and that's why, you know, Plum Village, I think, is such a, a light in the world, because when people come here, you know, and they slow down and they bring mindfulness into all their daily practices, whether it's eating or sitting or walking or talking or not talking, you know, people have, that's when people have insights, mm -hmm. is when they're not busy, when they're not, and when they, and when they bring the energy back into themselves and they listen to themselves and rather than always going outwards which again is the way out is in coming into ourselves in terms of what is the wisdom inside of us because you talk about you know wise effort and most often we're looking for answers outside of ourselves we're looking for wise people outside of ourselves to give us answers to tell us what to do whereas actually when we stop and look inside there's always wisdom there's always more there's a there's wise parts of us that when we access them, they, they give us the confidence to set forward because it's our wisdom, it's our understanding. And when we actually integrate that, then we can create real change. But when we're trying to take other people's wisdom or follow other people's way of seeing, actually we're, we're just copying something. Mm -hmm. But are we truly living that? Because is it truly us? And there's parts of us that are a continuation of other yes. people's things, but that are um, our unique way of expressing them or feeling them, or, uh, which is different than just the copying or thinking that we don't have anything to say. I mean, I come from research in academia. You can't have a sentence without citation, <laughs> right? Because someone will say, well, that's, <laughs> Thich Nhat Hanh said that. I'm like, well, yeah, so did a hundred other people in just a different way, right? So uh, my, my training, mm. What has always been cite, 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 to the point where you lose your own citation of like, what, what do I, what's yeah. my perspective on that? And it's been a real unlearning for me 
and also I think very, it can be very much, very much part of our healing to, to go inside and listen to our own wisdom and see that it's built on many wisdoms as well. It's, I think it's a both and, it's a paradox, yeah. right? One of the um, stories that uh, I was told about Thich Nhat Hanh was that um, when he was in his hermitage where uh, he, he lived part of the time, that uh, one of his books was delivered to him, you know, hot off the press. And he immediately took the book and he didn't say, yay, it's my book, look at this. Mm -hmm. He just walked in meditation to the altar and he placed it on the altar and he did sort of a practice called sort of touching the earth, which is prostrating on the ground. And what he was doing was thanking all, all the land, spiritual and human ancestors who had given him the support and wisdom and to, to be able to write that book. And it was, so what he was essentially saying is, this is not my book. This is, this is a book that has come through me from all that has come before. And it will feed into all that there is. And, and that sense of a continuum of life, that it's not, you know, I'm born and I'm dead and that's a life, but actually that we are part of a flow of life that will and that are part of that will then flow into the next life. Mm -hmm. And then someone down the line will say something because we'd help them to see something or we'd been present for them and, and then they'll take that on and share it. And, and it, it's this extraordinary flow. And, I, and I, I find that so helpful in moving beyond this fear of death and fear of, you know, am I making a big enough difference? Because actually, we don't have to do everything in our lifetimes. You know what, we might do one thing that leads to someone else doing a great thing in four lifetimes. Mm -hmm. and, and, to, and there's something about trusting in life that that's okay. Whereas when we're trying to control life and say actually, no, I've got to be relevant now, that we screw ourselves up. And there was one um, amazing example actually, there was a climate leaders retreat here and there was one of the young activists um, got off the bus, so but there's a the bus, there's a car park, and then the walk to the registration was about a hundred meters. And she, as she got off the bus, she said to herself, "I'm going to not look at my social media. I'm going to switch off. I'm going to not be present. You know, I'm going to be present to here and just cut off the outside influences." And she said, by the time she got to the registration office, a hundred meters she got this fear that she was no longer relevant. Mm -hmm. And I, and when she told this story, I was, you know, I mean, I have my own sort of fixations with social media, which I'm sort of having to work with a bit, but, but that she thought she'd lost her relevance in half a minute, that she was not present to that. You, you think, wow, what a life. What a life. And if you were to wait five more days, she'd feel very relevant. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Because you let it go a little bit. Yes. I mean, that, that you become relevant of, to yourself. To yourself. And to life. To life, to what you see, to the people that are next to you. Yeah. Uh, when, when I was off email just for the, you know, the week of being on retreat, um, I came back to my, to my email, this idea of busyness promotes more busyness. What I noticed was that sort of week back to my email, I had fewer and fewer and fewer it's as if people were not email. And maybe I'm not as relevant, or maybe yeah. I'm experiencing freedom from email. Yeah. You could look at it both ways, right? right. And that um, you know, the self-relevance actually makes us, I think, feel less relevant. So that's sort of a um, relief after you detox the first few days <laughs> here, that we feel more relevant. Everything feels more relevant. The trees and the flowers and the sounds and the birds all become very relevant. Yeah. yeah, it's an extraordinary process. And, and what's amazing is it doesn't take a long time, but what happens when people leave? And you know, that's the classic thing of retreats, isn't right. it? That you come and retreat, you'll have a great insight or you'll, you'll, you'll see life differently, but then you go back into the same world that you came out of with the same sort of uh, forces sort of impinging upon your life. And, and, and that is tough. And I remember when I was a young man and I first went, I was working for the Daily Telegraph. And I, I, was, I became Wall Street correspondent, so I went to New York the first time. And um, 
And I remember that it was the first time I'd really felt freedom. And what I, well, I had this image that I was like a, uh, I was like caught in a spider's web. And that every point where the spider's web was attached to something was somebody's expectations of me. And I realized I was living the life of someone else's, or lots of other people's expectations. And, and I went to see, started seeing a, a Jungian um, therapist at some point. And towards the, I think my contract was supposed to be for two years. And as I came towards the two years, I became really scared that when I went back to the UK, I wouldn't have the capacity to hold on to the changes that I had seen were necessary, that I, I just saw myself being, going back to the same people who had this, who's, would imagine I was the same person, wouldn't see any change, and I, and I wouldn't have the strength um, and courage to hold on to that. And, um, and luckily my contract was extended another year, and that year was a really precious year because it, it really allowed me to create a foundation that was strong enough so that when the pulls came, when I came back, that I was strong enough to hold my place in it. So, so there is something around, we could have many, many insights, but how do we integrate those into our life? And that, that, that's of course different for all of us, but it's so relevant. I think people think they have an insight and life is gonna change mm -hmm. and it doesn't necessarily happen. Well, f for me, what the, newer lesson around retreat because I've been on I mean I've been doing retreats since I was 14 years old right. it was the first time my mom took me on a retreat wow. and um, I would often come back with like my lit it would be like the last day of retreat <laughs> write all the things that I'm going to change <laughs> all the ways I'm going to do it differently it, this changes over time right of the different things that I'm going to do uh, and then you know a month or two out I've forgotten half of them and that's tucked away in a closet but what I have found uh, more recently that the expectation for me to do it alone is part of the problem, mm. <laughs> you know, that I actually have things in my life that are reminders and that either active reminders that are in on it. Like that's why my whole family comes, mm. right? We're all in on it. We yeah. all walk in and see the way out is in when we walk into our home. We all share the same bell at our dinner table. And so we're reminded we're a little mini sangha to remind um, mm. ourselves of each other but also there is so there's such abundance Christiana Figueres there's endless abundance of reminders to us everywhere mm. even this morning when we were leaving the meditation hall we did this beautiful meditation and I, as soon as I walked out there was a man who was standing right in front of the meditation hall leaving a voice memo <laughs> no, <serious>. wearing a <laughs> Maui shirt <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, Americans. <laughs> and, then, and, then I, and then I was like, oh, you're me, because I've done that. Yeah. I'm sure I've done it, maybe not in front of the meditation hall, yeah. but I've, I've been annoyingly on my phone. Maybe it's in front of my kid yeah. that I've done it or uh, in other settings. And that th those are the reminders too. When I have an irritation, the way out is in, I can look at that seed within myself and be like, oh, okay, this is a reminder. That's what I don't want. I don't want to do that. And I know I do it. So at least for me at the end of this retreat, I'm thinking about it, that I don't have to do this alone. None of us have to. More of us are waking up, especially the harder things get, mm. the, the more people wake up, I think, sometimes. Yeah. And uh, what are those reminders for us? Yeah. And, and, and that's very difficult for people within business organizations or large organizations, <laughs> yeah. but I, I'm, I'm working with a few people at the moment who are wanting to bring more consciousness into their organizations. And, and one of them leads an organization, another is struggling to make an impact in their sort of lower down in the so-called pecking order of business. And, and exactly what you say, if you, you know, and this classic thing, if one person goes away and then they come back to work with all this ideas of we could do oh, this yeah. and we could do that and then, and they hit this brick wall and then they can become even more disenchanted. So yes, um, it's, oh, let me see, we have very noisy Noisy sisters, nuns. Very noisy <laughs> nuns going past. <laughs> Just goes to show. Hi sisters. <laughs> So I, I, you know, I just think we have to be very conscious. And, and I think 
I, I mean, you know, for me, that's all. That's about mindfulness versus meditation. You know, it's being mindful during your day of what you're doing, how you're doing it. Uh, what, are, as you say, what are the feelings coming up? What, how do those relate to you know my past and just, and and it sounds like hard work. I'm, I'm constantly aware of what's going on, but actually, it's not hard work. It just mm. becomes second nature. Just becomes helpful because it's I can freeing. say, yeah. yeah, I can just say, oh, the reason I'm feeling. <laughs> angry in the moment it's because this is like this and yeah. and okay I, I don't need to be angry I can calm that anger down yeah. I don't have to respond all the time to, I don't have to be driven by my emotions I can be aware of my emotions recognize they're showing me as you say they're evidence of something mm -hmm. and the other thing about you know you talked about long lists uh, there was a scientist well known scientist who was here and he was so amazed by the retreat that he at the end of it, he said he said, I've got this list of 15 things I'm going to do. What do you think? I said, take off 14 of them. Right. Because one of the things is that, you know, in one practice are all the practices. If you start off with one small step that you can really commit to, then actually that leads to all the steps. And if you try and do all the steps, of course, you go nowhere. Of that list of 14, what was the one thing that you're practicing right now? Well, I'm practicing sitting with grief, actually, because mm -hmm. I've been looking, you know, just watching what's going on in the world mm -hmm. in the last, sort of, you know, well, I mean, all my life, but in the last year, just seeing, you know, the rise of populism and, and all, you know, the war in Gaza and Israel, the, you know, R Russia and Ukraine and, um, and this polarization. And, and I'm sort of sitting with the grief of that at the moment and not, quite sure how to what to do with that just just recognizing that you know just wondering whether you know just seeing you know when we step back we see life does go through cycles there's cycles of enlightenment and cycles of darkness mm -hmm. and um and it's just a question that i'm sort of asking myself is are, are we moving towards a cycle of uh, you know of darkness where the dark clouds are forming and and the times ahead will be very, very difficult, you know, with biodiversity loss and climate change and war and um, inequality and, you know, all, all the, you know, this poly crisis um, and, and this sort of growing despair and also this sense of, you know, are we leading, are we heading towards civilizational collapse? And, and, I, and, and there's a tension to hold in that because, you know, I also love life. I'm optimistic about life. I, you know, I, I think that if we're all good to each other and we start to create more sense of care and we, we're able to open our minds and, and, and be more caring about each other, about the world, then, then we can change things very, very quickly. And also seeing that maybe, um, maybe we don't have the capacity to do that and what that will mean. So, so I, I'm sort of sitting with that and not looking for an answer because I don't think there's an answer but just just holding that and just seeing where that takes me and recognizing that that, that is just in me and I will just allow it to sit with me but not to be overwhelmed by it but not to deny it and what, what it is to really sit with something that's way beyond my myself my capacity my capacity to influence and just say what is it to hold that. And it really is the practice of sitting with grief so that we increase our capacity yes. to be with grief. Yeah. And if it is a time of change towards those dark clouds, we need greater capacity. Yeah. And our children need greater capacity in, um, to be with grief without crumbling or doing harmful things to each other yeah. when we're in it. Yeah. So it's a good practice. God help us all. <laughs> God help us all. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, right now we're okay. Yeah, right now it's peaceful. Yeah. In this moment. It's quiet. That might be a good place to stop right there. <laughs> um, as we're recording this, I couldn't help but notice this gatha that's across the way that says, be beautiful, be yourself. Mm. Just staring right at us. <laughs> and um, I very much felt like you were very beautiful, very yourself. Thank you. In this interview. And it sounds like we're all going to be awaiting this book oh I don't know in October don't coming know. out well, some people may be too busy to read it. they may be too busy to read it <laughs> at some point um, the busyness of um, life will catch up with us and we'll want to read it 
Yeah. And, and it just, it's just about the simple practices of, you know, some of which we talk about now. So often we berate ourselves. We treat ourselves badly because we can't do something or we can't keep up with something. And I, I found so much is about what it is just to be tender with ourselves, what to be gentle, to be kind, you know, to how we would want to be treated by others is so rarely how we treat ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Joe Contino. You can check him out on The Way Out Is In and be on the lookout for his book with Brother Fapu, which will be out in October. You can probably pre-order it right now. Yeah, you can. You can usually pre-order these things yeah. well in advance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Wise Effort Podcast. Wise Effort is about you taking your energy and putting it in the places that matter most to you. And when you do so, you'll get to savor the good of your life along the way. If you would like to become a member of the Wise Effort Podcast, go to wiseeffort.com. And if you like this episode and think it would be helpful to somebody, please leave a review over at Podchaser. I would like to thank my team, my partner in all things, including the producer of this podcast, Craig. Ashley Hyatt, the podcast manager, and thank you to Ben Gold at Bell & Branch for our music. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only, and it's not meant to be a substitute for mental health treatment.